Welcome to Elevating Consciousness, the podcast that helps you discover deeper levels of truth, meaning, and wholeness. I'm your host, Artem Zen, and our guest today is a writer whose work focuses on the meaning crisis and the nature of spirituality and metamodernity. He earned his bachelor's in religious studies from the University of Vermont and his master's in religion and the arts from Yale University. He's the host of the Meta Modern Spirituality Podcast, where he interviews leading thinkers in the meta modernism, integral, synthesis, and game B spaces about the topics of meaning making and spirituality in today's world. He's also the author of a series of books, including the most recent, Emergentism, a religion of complexity for the meta modern world. Brendan Graham Dempsey, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so today, I really want to dive deep into your new book, Emergentism. But first, I'd love to hear a bit about your background and what made you want to study religion. So I was uh, brought up in a uh, religious household, uh, kind of the evangelical uh, Christian stripe. And that was sort of my introduction to things um, metaphysical, <laughs> I guess, and uh, what originally rooted me in um, kind of narratives of meaning and purpose. Um and became very interested in that uh, in my, I guess, high school years. Um, I'd always been sort of a, a doubter and a skeptic of sorts. So I was always going back uh, to the asking questions of things. And um, there's a whole long story there. Uh, got into, uh, there's a whole field actually called apologetics um, in evangelical Christianity, where you're trying to kind of use your reason, rationality, and apply evidence and uh uh, to claims of faith. And so that for a while sort of sated that kind of questioning uh, skeptical side of me. And I thought, oh, well, all this is clearly mapped out. It's all, it all holds up. It's all clearly rational and empirical. Um, and that sort of uh, helped for a little bit, keep the skeptical uh, doubter in me at bay. Um, but uh, ultimately I, I thought, well, if this stuff is really what life is all about, and it's really the most important thing you could really consider, I mean, we're talking about you know, the destiny of our souls and the nature of reality and the future of the world, that sort of a thing. I thought, well, well, I should spend my time. Uh, I should, uh, I should commit myself to the study of these things. Um, and so that was when I kind of committed myself to a, uh, trajectory of biblical studies and, uh, was planning to be, um, maybe like a professor at a seminary or something. I considered ministry briefly, but I, I thought um, it wasn't quite right for my particular skill set. Um, and so, yeah, I started diving into biblical studies and uh, the kind of historical critical um, scholarship uh, in my late teens and um, went to university and studied religion and classics and did the Greek and the Latin and the Hebrew and this and that. And um, and then, then I had uh, kind of a precipitous existential crisis when um, my studies clashed a lot with uh, the particular interpretations and the narrative that I'd uh, grown up with. Um, and a lot of that skepticism and doubt kind of came roaring back and uh, I couldn't kind of reconcile these two visions. And yet I was highly rationally convinced of the scholarship. Uh, I found it very compelling and convincing. And so eventually I could no longer maintain my more conservative uh, interpretations. And uh, more than that, I just kind of had to let the whole edifice of my particular religious faith go. Uh, and uh, and hurled myself into the world of atheism and nihilism and uh, aesthetic hedonism, which is a, a different story to tell. But anyway, that's my background initially in uh, my introduction to religion, spirituality, um, and it's been sort of a long trek from kind of an early um, conservative, even literalist kind of evangelicalism uh, all the way to where I'm at now, which is a bit further uh, away from that. But it, that does kind of uh, inform my uh, thinking about things in the sense of um, uh, I'm aware uh, of of the way that meaning can be engaged uh, in that way. And uh, I also find uh, uh, I find that it's, in the context of like a meaning crisis, it's important to be aware of that. And maybe we can get into that sort of a thing. But yeah. Yeah, um, I I'm guess I'm really curious about how you what what. What was the integration after that? But maybe we could speak about that a little later because I'm sure as we dive deeper into the book, that will you can share more of how that was relevant in your own life. 
Um, I think it's important to um, talk about the meaning crisis and what that is. And probably most people listening to this podcast have at least a vague sense of what the meaning crisis is. And I'm just curious, how do you understand it? How do you form formulate it? How do you talk about it? Think about it? Yeah. Um, so kind of the experience I just described, uh, I, I experienced as a meaning crisis, a sort of individual meaning crisis where I'd had this narrative and this worldview um, that was my basis for meaning and purpose and uh, making sense of the world. And then I experienced that sort of fall away and um, disappear. And that was occasioned by, uh, yeah, phenomenologically, all this sort of um, vertiginous confusion, loss of orientation, um, sense of despair, a sense of uh, anxiety, uncertainty, um, a kind of desperation for uh, grounding, foundations, orientation, that sort of a thing. Um, and then a kind of fundamental dissolution of the basis for a lot of givens, uh, things about, you know, why do we, why do we do what we do? Why do we treat other people the way that we treat other people? What's the basis of ethics, morality? Um, yeah, I find that, uh, orientation is sort of a good, um, way of thinking about these issues of what what orients us in the world what what helps us navigate the world and um and that's precisely kind of what you lose in an individual experience of a meaning crisis and so in terms of the meaning crisis um the way that i think about that is sort of that phenomenological uh, description that i just gave sort of writ large you know like like experiencing that at a collective level um that there's sort of a pervasive sense of existential confusion and malaise and lack of orientation, a uh, kind of desperate casting about for um, frameworks to help navigate the world, um, and sort of the the various kinds of uh, unsuccessful ways uh, or incomplete ways that that resolves itself in, in individual lives. But yeah, the meaning crisis I tend to think of as sort of a collective version of uh, what individually can happen when people uh, kind of get the foundations knocked out from under them. Um, and that can happen in all sorts of ways too. Um, you know, I just differentiate between like uh, vertigo, which is kind of what I've just des described, uh, where you kind of have a framework and then it, and it disappears. And so you kind of are falling through the void. Uh, that's one experience, but it requires that you first have some sense of meaning to begin with that you lose. Um, but a lot of people don't really have that. Uh, even growing up, we just grow up in a context where a lot of these frameworks are no longer, um, you know, uh, th things that people buy into anymore. So uh, people more and more don't even have a kind of familiarity with any say like religious um framework or what have you and so in that context um it's much more like nausea um, which is what sartre described in you know uh, kind of his existentialist writing where like nothing really seems to matter things move about they change you know experiences are tacked onto experiences people come they go and that's basically all there is um and in that sense there's not even really um there's a sense that something's off like that that this isn't right that there's something missing um but it's almost like you've kind of been born blind and, and never knew uh what what vision was and so you're just sort of like well this isn't this isn't quite right and so yeah it's sort of like the difference between like going blind versus being born blind or something like that um you the difference between losing something versus never having it but in each case there's a sense that um something is no longer there uh and uh and there's a sense of absence or lack or 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 something missing um and so yeah i would say that uh, versions of those two things characterize our collective meaning crisis and then people respond to that situation uh, in all sorts of ways. And most of them are not uh, particularly constructive or successful or um, lead to uh, their own flourishing or the flourishing of society. So that's what makes it sort of a real collective challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I think another thing that I'm picking up about the meaning crisis, and I think this was heavy kind of in your book 
is this kind of collapse or this gap between science and religion. And in your book, you kind of unpack the modern scientific reductionism view and the traditional fundamentalism. And these are like the two most popular wor worldviews today. And on the, on the surface, these views seem to be in like direct opposition. But if we look closer, there's like strong parallels. So can you speak on like these parallels and why both of these views are problematic in today's world? Yeah, sure. So uh, that was a good framing of it. Yeah. Um, uh, there's when you're confronted with this sort of lack of meaning, uh, there are kind of different approaches that you can have to that situation. One approach is to just sort of um, uh, embrace it and even kind of celebrate it, sort of wallow in it. Um, and that is usually what we mean by like uh, nihilism, right? There's just a sense of like, uh, a self-consciousness to the lack of meaning for the for the um, for the despairing uh, recognition that anything like meaning isn't even possible. So we might as well just sort of give ourselves over to hedonistic enjoyment. Um, we, you know, we have a one life, and uh, all we really uh, can govern ourselves by or orient ourselves towards is our own pleasure and, and personal fulfillment. Um, and that can be material goods or power or what have you, uh, pleasure of all sorts or, yeah, um, people's what what then tends to drive or orient people can be uh, uh, it can vary, but it's usually, you know, rooted in the individual self. And it's something that um, because there are no real constraints, uh, either from without uh, or within at that point that you just sort of um, kind of rapaciously uh, seek to. Um, meet your own desires um, in a way that no longer has regard for the world, for others, um, that sort of a thing. Um, it's sort of like the idea in uh, Dostoevsky, uh, I think it's in the Brothers Karamazov, where, uh, you know, Ivan is talking to Alyosha, and he basically says, well, you know, if, if basically, if there is no God, then all is permissible, right? And, and that's sort of um, the, that is the I think most immediate form of kind of nihilistic um, rapaciousness that, uh, well, there's no one, there's no one watching from above. There's no, you know, inherent moral compass. There's all these things that maybe I used to believe or, you know, uh, or, or maybe were never even um, kind of imbued in me in, in any way to begin with. None of that holds. And so anything is possible and whatever I can get away with and whatever I can do in the world to, uh, yeah, kind of get mine um, is sort of justified. And so that's kind of a classic sort of nihilistic, hedonistic uh, response to a lack of meaning. Um, and that, of course, leads to really terrible outcomes. Uh, you get people who just sort of, uh, yeah, are going to burn through life and they'll do whatever it takes to get theirs. And that means, um, you know, in terms of using the resources of the earth or trying to, um, you know, acquire positions of power, climb the ladder, whatever, they'll step on whoever it takes. They'll do whatever it takes without regard to other people, because as long as their bank accounts getting bigger and uh, they're, they're uh, you know, succeeding in a sort of kind of crude, basic materialistic way, then, you know, they're winning in their mind at the game of life. Um, now, another version, another response is to look at the meaninglessness or the presumed meaninglessness of things and to recoil from that and to say, no, 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 thank you. I need meaning. This is, this is the idea that we might just be uh, purposeless organisms, uh, you know, wearing meat suits, traveling through space, uh, going nowhere is a little bit too bleak of a possibility for me. Um, and so I will find whatever I can to sort of basically deny that possibility and uh, and give myself a, a sense of purpose to my existence. And the way that a lot of people are doing that is through fundamentalist forms of religion, more simplistic kind of creeds and um, approaches to existential matters where uh, you have a, a nice set 
of beliefs, you know, that can kind of get you through and uh, everything's okay. And in the end, you know, there's a good God and he loves you and he'll take care of you and just believe in him. And, and, uh, you know, the, the, the world will indeed burn, um, at the final judgment, let's say. Uh, but as long as you're one of the elect, then, uh, you don't have to worry about anything because you'll have that eternal life of paradise, um, in the hereafter. Um, and so various forms of sort of fundamentalism, and this is, you know, this is Christian fundamentalism, uh, Muslim fundamentalism, and so on, uh, sort of responds to the uh, narrative of modernity and modernization, industrialization, mechanization, uh, and recoils from it and reacts to it and sort of seeks for more um uh, comforting ideas in more simplistic kind of narrative mythological frameworks, um, which tend to be apocalyptic in thinking, which are sort of like, gosh, things are not going well. Uh, uh, things are, are really nasty out there. And um, but that's OK, because if we believe X, Y and Z, then we'll get out of here. We'll go to heaven and this you know, old earth will burn and we will be uh, among the elect in paradise. Um, and to get at your question, I mean, ultimately, these sort of do lead to the same outcome, right? Um, if you're a nihilist and you're just rapaciously consuming and materialistic and doing whatever it takes to get ahead for yourself, um, you're going to see the outcomes of spoiling the earth and and consuming resources at an unsustainable rate and, um, you know, not really regarding other people as ends unto themselves, but just considering the means, right? But ironically, if you're a pious believer in some form of, uh, you know, fundamentalist uh, dogma, you'll look at the world more or less the same way. Um, the world's going to end soon. Uh, you know, people aren't really ends into themselves unless they're part of the elect. So they're just sort of, uh, you know, there's a very kind of transactional nature um, between social uh, relationships. And there's a sense that all of this is temporary, impermanent, and doesn't really matter. So uh, you, again, are apt to treat the world uh, like something you can just rapaciously consume, get yours, uh, or at least get, uh, it, there's a different mentality to it. So it's not just get yours while you can, but it's sort of like, do whatever you need to do um, to take advantage or exploit the natural resources that God, let's say, has provided. Um, because these aren't really the eternal things. They just, they're just means, right? Um, and so anyway, both of these things lead to the same sort of outcome of a, a spoiled, uh, ravaged earth, um, unsustainable living, uh, transactional relationships with people, et cetera. And, um, you know, Nietzsche was a philosopher who kind of began to recognize this sort of ironic aspect to nihilism, uh, where basically it's not just the belief that life has no meaning that's nihilism you can say that life has a meaning but if it's to get out of life then that is its own form of nihilism and so really even fundamentalist forms of religious belief are their own forms of nihilism uh, which means that what we really need if we're going to live flourishing sustainable lives here on the on the planet and make things better and uh, and kind of experience the full potential of a human existence we can't really be uh committing ourselves to either of those solutions. We need to affirm the value of life here. We need to affirm the value of our existence uh, on this planet, in this material universe. And uh, that is the yes saying to life that is different from the various forms of fundamentalism out there. And it's really kind of, uh, that's what the meaning crisis sort of demands that we um, find our way towards collectively. Yeah, it, it seems like those with a predominantly traditional worldview are somehow sheltered from the meaning crisis as they find meaning in their religion. And, and then those with a predominantly modern worldview shelter themselves from meaninglessness by taking on the religion of scientism or capitalism. Uh, would you say that our sense of meaning mostly breaks down in a uh, predominantly postmodern worldview when where everything becomes relativistic. Perhaps this is where we find the greatest number of people who label themselves as spiritual but not religious. Those who have like a spiritual longing but struggle to find a way to ground that in their daily lives. Yeah, I think that uh, sheltering is a good word. Um, and uh, I can certainly experience or speak to the experience of, of various kinds of sheltering um, in that sense. Uh, um, yeah, I think that the, yeah, again, this kind of breaks down into kind of different camps and different sorts of responses. Like, 
Um, I think you're right. I mean, there is there is a sort of sheltering that can occur when people choose to, let's say, respond to this sense of meaninglessness by affirming a scientist's, uh, what would you say, uh, scientism, scientistic, I guess would be the adjectival form, a scientistic approach um, or, or worldview. And uh, and that's very much what sort of modernity was defined by the sort of sense of utopian progress, everything will get better, and won't that be nice? Um, and uh, doesn't really then own up to the genuine problems that that, that we face and the real uh, challenges of the world. I mean, this is really the problem of, of worldviews in general, is that there, we're all, we always seem to be trying to shield ourselves from some aspect of reality with them right um and uh they they serve a function uh for us existentially but depending on what those different worldviews are they will be hiding certain parts of the picture from us so that we can avoid that kind of cognitive dissonance i think and so that's always the danger of uh any kind of grand narratives or worldview structures um when it comes to postmodernism and the sort of relativism, though, uh, yeah, I think that um, there's a there's a sense in which people are recognizing that some sense of spiritual orientation is deeply valuable. That like having some kind of groundedness, some kind of ritual, some tradition, etc., like that seems to have some really intrinsic value to it uh, for human flourishing. Um, but unfortunately, it sort of tends to be framed, yeah, within relativistic terms that uh, that well, we can all live our, in our own story, and we don't we don't really need anything beyond that uh, because truth doesn't exist, and and everything's sort of relative. So um, we can all find our own. Um, answer to these issues um and and the problem with this is that it does lead to a sort of superficiality right and this is a lot of the problem with sort of new age spirituality um it's sort of like okay i'll take i'll take this element from this tradition this element from this tradition um and then and then on top of that it's sort of like well you know if if no epistemological framework is any better than others then like i'll take my healing crystals here and i'll take um you know my I don't know, some other form of uh, some other religious practice here, but like things that that probably aren't um, grounded, let's say, in in uh, they might not be grounded in sort of a modernist rationalistic framework. Right. But like but that's OK, because because that's just relative and nothing's necessarily better than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. So that's coming back to this idea of now. Now we have science. Science is here. We can't ignore it. Right. So it's like somebody that's still holding on to a uh, traditional fundamentalist view. They have to kind of ignore some of the science stuff. They got to ignore, they got to, you know, not look at that. They only have to read certain books. But now when you start expanding your mind and reading different books, now there's, now that's where the doubt starts coming in. So I guess we kind of unpack the meaning crisis a little bit. Maybe this is a good time to, uh, for you to introduce emergentism and, and what that is. And, and there's a lot of pieces to it. So I'm not sure exactly how you want to go about it, but um, maybe, maybe start from the most basic, like what, what is that? Where did you come across this idea? And yeah, what is, how does yeah. it, how does it bridge these views? Yeah. I mean, so um, yeah, what I'm calling this emergentist uh, kind of story framework um, is really in many ways, sort of the culmination of my own spiritual and intellectual journey over the past 15 years or so, um, and sort of a distillation of, um, yeah, a, a lot of my thought and, you know, the sense that the things I feel like I've discovered over that time period, uh, kind of trying to bring those things together into a manageable sort of synthesis and say, okay, this is, this is a, this is a framework for meaning. This is something that can, um, provide that orientation in a helpful way, uh, but by avoiding fundamentalist religion and, and nihilism. Um, yeah, so uh, in some ways to get at this most would require kind of a 
uh, an unpacking of global history, which I do a little bit in the book, taking us from sort of holistic uh, religion of the past, uh, walking us through kind of the rise of reductionistic science, um, and then uh, leading into the uh, more recent advent of sort of complexity science and the um, kind of various paradigms that that affords for meaning making and sense making. And that is sort of the arc uh, that brings us to emergentism. But I don't necessarily need to rehearse all of that here. Um, I guess I would say just in summary, emergentism is a, it's a way of looking at the world that allows us to regain a sense of purpose and meaning to existence uh, by grounding that in uh, the scientific advances uh, related to integrative complexity theory. Um, uh, yeah, it's always a little bit difficult to try to summarize these things in a, in a simple, pithy way. Um, and there's always the danger of either making it sound too kind of wooey and simplistic or too fine-grained, you know, uh, granular and complex. So I want to try to um, navigate the uh, those extremes. Um, in brief, I guess I would say that the meaning crisis, as, as we've been talking about uh, historically, I think can be really traced to the advent of um, reductionist science in the in the at the dawn of modernity that kind of broke that that old pre-modern religious worldview and uh, basically challenged so many of its core assumptions uh, by presenting us with this new way of seeing the world. Um, which was in, in, incredibly valuable, uh, but also really problem, problematized the way that people understand their relationship to the world, uh, to other people, um, and to themselves. And uh, by sort of mm, breaking things apart in a way that led to people feeling like we were no longer... Um, we no longer had free will. Everything was determined. Um, we were all just sort of particles moving in space, you know, that sort of a thing. And that that way of thinking uh, can really do a number on people's sense of meaning, especially if they used to believe that, like, they had souls and were created by a, you know, divine omnipotent being that had a plan for their life, etc. So, like, that, that shift that occurs from the pre-modern to the modern worldview is really profound and I think sets the stage for our contemporary meaning crisis. Um, now what emergentism kind of shows is that that reductionistic scientific way of looking at things is actually wrong. Um, that, uh, that we're not just particles in space. We're not just forces acting on each other. We can't just look to the smallest particles and therefore understand our nature. Um, but it doesn't say that, uh, from a kind of reactionary fundamentalist angle, it's not attacking science per se, uh, and saying, no, 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 this is wrong because otherwise we don't have meaning. Uh, it's, it's under, it's, it's critiquing and undermining a purely reductionistic view from better science, um, which has come, a, a, along over the past, you know, uh, 80 years or so, uh, but really started to really come into its own as a paradigm in the last, you know, let's say 30 or 40. Uh, and that's complexity science. And the difference here is that whereas reductionism kind of broke everything into its parts and tried to understand everything kind of mechanistically that way, um, complexity science takes those parts and sees the broader holes that they comprise. It sees, it, it, it sees their their part realities, but it also appreciates that they form dynamic webs of relationship uh, that create a whole with their own emergent properties. Um, and that has some really profound implications then for how we understand ourselves and the world and others uh, and, and make meaning in it. Because, um, you know, now I can appreciate that, like, uh, I can relate to you at the level of a human being and your level, your, your humanity is not reducible to your atoms, right? And you're not just particles in motion being acted upon by, by, you know, forces, that sort of a thing. There are many integrative levels building up to create the dynamics that make you as a person and that govern our interaction right now. And um, I think that on the face of it, that can be really helpful for people to hear, right? It's like, oh, you mean there's actually more to the world than just fundamental physics, let's say. Um, and so you can begin to see how appreciating this sort of tiered nature of reality um, can start to uh, undermine the premises of a kind of nihilistic view of the world built on reductionism. 
Um, so it also avoids this sort of fundamentalist reactionary response because it's not going back. We're not saying, oh, we need to jettison science. We need to lose reductionism. We just need to integrate the insights of reductionism into an, a broader paradigm, which is what complexity science does. Um, so it's sort of a, it's a progressive forward moving uh, paradigm uh, emergentism that's trying to reframe meaning um, through the lens of really better science than the sort of science that initially caused the meaning crisis to begin with. Um, and so, yeah, basically emergentism then takes those scientific paradigms, takes those ideas and uh, and considers them through the lens of meaning making. Um, and more specifically, it really tries to um, formulate a religious sensibility based on uh, it, those findings and what that really means, um, because we're starting to see a new cosmic story uh, that this uh, uh, complexity science is sort of telling us. We're starting to see that um, that there's a, a new way of of understanding how things hold together, um, the different levels of reality, and where everything's going, uh, and uh, and all of which is a lot more exciting and and dare and and maybe even optimistic than the uh, more pessimistic view that the reductionist scientist paradigm um suggested so that would be i don't know an attempt to try to summarize it uh real briefly and then we can kind of get into some of the details if you want yeah um I, I found that that part of the book was the most technical but that was i i felt like the most important too because like understanding that was like the bridge uh, so it, it took a little bit to understand that, but in essence, it's like complexity is, is the idea that, you know, my understanding is that the part, the parts come together to create a, a greater whole and, and the emergence is greater than, than the sum of the parts on, on their own, like the come bringing them together creates a greater emergence. And you actually, you mentioned, um, Greg Henrik's theory of knowledge, which mm. proposes that complexity builds on itself. Um, and maybe you could kind of speak on that theory, because I think that really shows this idea of complexity so people can kind of grasp it better. Sure. Yeah. Um, so uh, so Greg, uh, Greg Henriquez's uh, theory of uh, or unified theory of knowledge is basically um, a big history framework. Um, so big history is, you know, all the way back to the Big Bang and, you know, uh, situating uh what we know of reality in the in the broadest sort of uh, narrative scope possible. Um, it's not just hey, human history over the past few thousand years. It's going you know three point thirteen point eight billion years and tracking the whole uh, story of cosmic evolution. Um, Greg Enriquez is a, a psychologist, um, but he found that basically in order to really clarify the nature of the mind and the psyche, you have to frame it in a really big history way. That's the only way that we can really understand uh, its 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 uh, reality because it it's built on the various levels of emergent uh, uh, evolution. So um, in Enriquez's model, there are four kind of levels uh, of existence. Uh, there's the matter level, there's the life level, there's the the mind level, uh, and then there's the culture level. So matter, life, mind, culture. And this forms a stack uh, as each of these levels emerges out of the previous one. So life emerges from matter, mind emerges from life, and culture emerges from mind. Um, and so you can see this cumulative nature of reality. Um, and uh, yeah, he does root it in in the insights of complexity science. So that, for example, um, you know, with mind emerging out of life, let's say. Uh, I should make clear too that um, in this model, the word mind is actually referring to um, the nervous system and uh, what you get when you have a kind of complex organisms with uh, linked neuronal uh, you know, networks, basically. Um, and so, uh, so understanding that uh, that each of these levels uh, kind of exists according to its own laws on its own terms, let's say. 
I think is really important um, because it it starts to show why the whole reductionist thing just breaks down. You can't understand things in terms of uh, lower level scale. So um, another insight of Enriquez is that each of these levels is sort of defined by the advent of a new information processing system. Um, so DNA, uh, which is sort of the, this joint point between matter, right, and life, um, is really this information processing code that exists at that level. Um, and then mind is an information processing system that occurs through the network nervous system. Um, and it's processing, you know, experiential phenomena. And then culture comes online when you get uh, symbolic language um, and, and yeah, uh, words and uh, the whole narrative uh, aspect to existence, which is what human beings are really uniquely defined by. Um, but yeah, it can it can start to explain some really interesting things about reality. Um, for instance, that uh, you know, if you want to talk about the mind, if you want to understand the mind, you have to at least appreciate that it's two, it's those two levels, right? That, that that I have a a mind level and a culture level to my psyche, let's say. Um, so I have a kind of experiential part of my mind uh, that is based on my nervous system, getting inputs from the environment and that sort of a thing. And so my emotions and my, uh, you know, ref reflexes and that, all that stuff is in me and, and psychology has studied those things. Um, but that's not all that I am. Right. And I think this is where it starts to clarify that like the reductionist thing can really cause problems in our meaning making if we just reduce things and we say we're just X, Y and Z. Right. Oh, well, the mind is just chemicals. Right. If you do that, you've already reduced the complexity of something down to a, 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 a lower level. Like chemicals are just at the level of, of matter. Right. So if I say, oh, well, the, all, the whole experience, my whole kind of conscious awareness is just chemicals. It's just, you know, then it's like, OK, you've reduced the vast complexity of the human experience to something rather crude. And uh, I think justly we kind of recoil from that. We're like, oh, that's at the very least, it doesn't seem right. But more than that, it seems sort of disappointing and, and kind of depressing. And I think both of those are, we're intuiting something isn't right about that because it isn't because to talk about the reality of a human uh, psychological experience of reality, we have to, we have to appreciate that it's a material aspect to it that, and that that forms ultimately the substrate for a biological aspect. Uh, and that that forms the substrate for a neuronal aspect and that that forms a substrate for a uh, cultural linguistic aspect conceptual, symbolic. And so we as people are all of those things. So it's a really rich tapestry of all these different forms of information, all linked through a cosmic stack. And um, and that's important, right? Because, yeah, to tie that back to the meaning crisis, is, which is what I'm trying to do with emergentism, is to show that, um, yeah, we're, we're bound to misunderstand, misinterpret, uh, uh, and mistake the world if we uh, lose appreciation for our sense of the multi-layered complex uh, reality uh, that, that we are. So that's that would be one way of, of linking, you know, this way of thought, this paradigm of complexity to the meaning crisis and how that can help resolve things. But more than that, and I think this is even kind of, uh, you know, this is really the, the, I don't know, the meat of it, um, that this complexity that I'm speaking about is the story it's this big history story that that has been unfolding for the past almost 14 billion years and that um that stack matter life mind culture um came online over a period of 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 many epochs of many eons of time as the universe has been complexifying and so um you know for the first uh let's see well you know starting 13.8 billion years ago you had matter um, and that existed and you had particles and atoms and, you know, that formed galaxies and stuff like that and stars. Um, but then starting around, at least on this planet, 3.6 billion years ago, then you get this life thing happen and life emerges from the interactions of, of these, of these uh, material elements. And then, you know, around 700 million years ago, you get mind and the, and the nervous system. And then sometime around, I don't know, uh, well, this is a kind of open question. 5,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, somewhere around there, you get culture. Um, and so this is a this is a chronological unfolding of depth and complexity. 
And what's really compelling about that is that this is this seems to be built into the fabric of reality, that like the universe naturally, inherently, spontaneously complexifies. It's becoming more rich and intricate. And in the process, it creates human minds. It creates the, the, the conditions for this really deep, rich internal experience. Um, and I talk about how, you know, this relates to the deepening of uh, of consciousness, which being on uh, this podcast, ele- elevating uh, the consciousness is uh, very apropos because it's sort of like this is the story by which that happens, that the complexity, big history narrative is the story of of the elevation of consciousness through time. And uh, that to me is very profound and beautiful. And I think uh, warrants um, a kind of religious-like sensibility in awe and wonder and appreciation of it. And yet it's coming from science. It's coming from uh, really uh, cutting edge um, empirical and theoretical science. And, uh, and so we're no longer, you know, having to war against the outcomes and the seeming um, conclusions of reductionism. Uh, we, and we're no longer struggling to, you know, clutch some basic sense of meaning from, you know, the, from, from these narratives that are um, coming out of, uh, yeah, kind of a uh, reductionistic, materialistic, mechanistic uh, stories. Um, now we're seeing that science itself is telling a new story um, and that it's, it's a, it's an inspiring one. And so that's what emergentism is sort of trying to celebrate and to articulate and to uh, engage um, in all of the religious sorts of ways that people have used to engage with religion and meaning and purpose um, and to do that very intentionally. So that's my long winded sort of uh, answer there. Yeah. um, This may be a difficult thing to imagine or conceptualize, but (laughs) what will, what is the next layer of complexity after culture like i don't know if you've thought about that i don't know if it's hard artificial intelligence or like what it could be i i don't even know but th- that's that was just the question that was popping up when i was reading that part i was like huh it's like i wonder what's next yeah well it's a really important question i mean and and something that this narrative does help point us towards in understanding uh or being able to uh, speculate about in a reasonably informed way. Um, Because if you take the idea seriously that complexification, these levels that have emerged of matter, life, mind, culture have been based on novel information processing systems, um, then it would seem to be that whatever comes after, let's say, culture, the culture level, uh, will also be predicated on a novel information processing system. And so, you know, what new information processing system comes out of culture? Um, and it, it, I, I think it's, it's a very reasonable idea that that is the digital infrastructure that's been created. Um, you know, the, the entire technological, um, yeah, uh, system that we've produced, um, I guess, ultimately rooted in this sort of binary code uh, structure, but, you know, of course, even that's starting to change and develop and complexify. Uh, but something like this um, virtual aspect to reality, let's say, does seem to have come online that's based on the substrate of uh, culture. And um, I find that a very compelling uh, case. And so I think that that's true. Um, but I think that another thing that I'm certainly trying to articulate with emergentism and other folks in the sort of metamodern ecosystem I know are concerned about is that um, we need to avoid simplistic uh, interpretations of that, right? So it can be very easy now to just say, oh, well, then the transhumanists must, must be right. And everything is just leading to this technological singularity and we'll all become cyborgs or who knows, maybe we'll lose our materiality entirely. And just, you know, we'll, the, our, the whole reason why we existed was to give birth to machines or whatever. You start actually leading to, into some rather kind of dark, pessimistic views in my in my opinion, about reality, um, if you go in certain kind of misguided directions with this way of thinking. So one of the things that I do want to articulate with emergentism is uh, that that shouldn't that shouldn't be our response to that. Uh, we need to appreciate that, for example, all of these levels of complexity are built on the ones before, right? If you were to cut out the matter level, you're going to lose 
symbolic language and everything requires our uh, our nervous system to be intact. You know, if you cut out the life level and you say, okay, we're going to get rid of all DNA, you're going to lose mind and culture. Um, so these things rest on each other, which means that it's like building a building, you know, and you can't just sort of like take out the foundation because everything's going to fall. So I think that this is a, a point where the transhumanists go awry because anyone who wants to say, oh, well, then we'll just lose our biological substrate. We'll just upload our minds into the, you know, into the cloud and that sort of a thing. I think are missing something really fundamental, which is that ultimately what we need to do is ground whatever our next level is on where we've been and what we are. And so we need to be thinking in terms of if we're going in that direction, how do we do it in a way that's sustainable, right? And the way that's sustainable is to make sure that whatever uh, technological progress that we're that we're um, headed towards, including AI especially, uh, needs to be rooted in a material, a biological, a neuronal, and a cultural substrate so that it is grounded. Um, and we we run the risk of making all sorts of catastrophic mistakes if we think that we can cut out any of those levels. So, you know, it does start to lead to very practical outcomes and implications for that, right? So like something like augmented reality might be a better way of thinking about the future of this than say total virtual reality. Um, because then, yeah, you know, uh, like we don't want to find ourselves living in a hellish dystopia where you know we're all just sort of like in dark rooms you know being intravenously the fed. matrix yeah exactly right we want to avoid that um now we can avoid that by augmenting and su supplementing our the rest of our existence with these kinds of technologies and i think that that can be very good um but yeah we we need to walk that that path uh intelligently and so um having a groundwork having a framework like this complexity model like um like you talk or emergentism or what have you this whole general emergentist paradigm uh of complexity and integrative levels i think makes clear um the dangers and and uh and how we can avoid those more clearly and so i think that that's really missing from a lot of the discussion yeah, like when you were saying that, I was imagining like using a virtual reality uh, thing to kind of change your mind state, so mm -hmm. like temporarily get like out of a certain mind state. So similar how you know they use ketamine and and certain psychedelics maybe to he help somebody with depression. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a potential to use a virtual reality and somebody is able to have some kind of an experience that you know resets their brain in some way resets the way they're functioning puts them in a different state of mind but it's not like you're hooking them up to something and they're just you know in this completely you know like a matrix kind of thing like you're in this pod and uh it, it, you're, it's not connected to actual reality so that that is an interesting to, thing to think about um you you write that matter is fundamental yes but it is not on that account the ultimate matter is the least complex of our emergences and thus the least conscious. At the same time, we must not forget that all consciousness that emerges has a material substrate. So I'm wondering if emer if the emergentism view is antithetical to idealism, which in my understanding proposes uh, uh, that consciousness is fundamental. Um, from you know from where does matter arise? Like how how does emergentism yeah. make sense of that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, in this book, I do tend to articulate things mostly within a small e emergentist framework, um, which is to suggest that matter, um, let's say that, um, that mind emerges out of matter. Um, but I don't think that that's necessary to kind of grok a capital E emergentist, uh, you know, narrative, right? And the, the, capital E emergentist, like emergentism as a sort of like religious uh, narrative that I'm trying to articulate uh, is one in which, yeah, uh, the universe complexifies over time that leads to the deepening of consciousness, increasing self-knowledge, goodness, power, uh, beauty, love, wonder, etc. Um, and that I think holds true regardless of whether you take an emergentist, small e, uh, interpretation of mind or you take an idealist one because ultimately what's the same in 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 this uh issue is um even if mind is is fundamental uh it the way it is experienced changes depending on the complexity of the organism uh and so 
ultimately, yeah, there can be sort of almost like different theological schools of whether you want to interpret mind as something going all the way down um, in a panpsychist way, let's say. Um, and actually, to be honest, I've become a lot more amenable to and supportive of that idea. I think it it can resolve a lot of problems. The hard problem of consciousness um, being the foremost, I think. Um, but it also seems to integrate really well or dovetail really well with um, our kind of our best theories of consciousness at the moment, like integrated information theory, which has panpsychic implications. So I think that that view is valid entirely uh it works let's say um and we can argue and 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 come to different conclusions based on the evidence which will keep shifting and growing i think uh you know uh, uh, around these issues um but yeah to reiterate i think that uh both sides let's say can agree that whatever form of consciousness uh is going on in say a bat or uh the a, a worm, uh, you know, is going to be of a very different kind than, let's say, human consciousness or that of a dog, right? Where there's this appreciation for a scale or a gradation or a continuum of the depth and richness of of consciousness, and it does seem to be the case that that scale, that that depth, um, is related directly related to the complexity of the organism. So at the level of mind of a nervous system, if you have a nervous system that's, you know, like a human nervous system, that's billions and billions of, of internet, internetwork neurons all relating with sensory inputs, taking in from the environment, integrating information throughout your body, et cetera, it's going to be very different from like an ant, you know, <laughs> which has many fewer uh, uh, connections going on. And so that's going to dictate the depth and richness of the consciousness. Um, so we can, so, so we can, realize that there is this scale in this in this this sort of continuum of the depth of consciousness um and then at that point it just becomes a question of all right well where does this scale taper off right um so emergentist minded folks are going to uh uh, d determine that differently uh, based on their, you know, theoretical basis and idealists are going or panpsychists are going to uh come to a basically the conclusion that it goes all the way down. So something like atoms have some sense of, of, of what it's like to be that thing. Um, and yeah, ultimately I think that I, I think both frameworks are, have a lot going for them either way. And um, I myself am kind of going back and forth and, and I'm really in deeply engaged in trying to um, explore this issue more myself at the moment. So I will probably be clarifying better where I land on this issue. But ultimately, um, emergentism, capital E, the religion of emergentism, uh, is the same kind of grand narrative, uh, no matter how you uh, determine where consciousness lands in that in that story, like if it's fundamental or if it emerges. Yeah, so I, I think right now is maybe a good time to talk about um well, kind of how you started to understand reality or, you know, in, in your book, you talk about God and, and reconceptualizing God. And maybe, you know, in I, I don't know how you conceptualized God before, like coming from a religious background. And my understanding is like God is like this man in the sky or it's like you, you get to heaven and then you finally, you know, to the, get to the pearly gates and then you finally get to experience God. And then, you know, in the nihilistic frame, you there, well, there is no, there is no higher power. There is no, there's nothing that orders reality. There's just pure, you know, it's just, everything is bleak. And um, then in, in, it seems like in the emergentism view, it's you're reconceptualizing God. And maybe there's a diff, there's a different, there's something different between like having the direct experience and 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 saying like oh that was a direct experience of god or this is a direct experience of god but there is something about like the human mind can't still even even so the human mind can't help but create concepts so i'm just wondering like how that concept evolved for you and and kind of where you landed right now with yeah. this concept of god well that's interesting because they're kind of the same uh the same response in terms of how i came to where I'm at and the story that I'm telling uh, about, about God, because, um, you know, so one of the things that, that you get from this complexification narrative uh, is that, yeah, okay, if the universe starts with the Big Bang and complexifies and you go from matter to life 
to to culture or matter to life to mind to culture and there's complexification that's increasing at all these levels well that continues you know so culture the level of culture is complexifying um it's complexifying is um because that's kind of what defines the culture level is our the emergence of symbolic language so our linguistic codes and the the concepts that we use in culture uh continues to evolve and to complexify and God is a concept in culture. Uh, and so the God concept continues to complexify. So as it does, you can start to chart that evolutionary progression of the God concept. And, um, you know, when you do that, uh, you, you see uh, the shift, the metamorphosis of the very idea of God from that sort of old man in the sky to these different conceptions, right? Um, and very simply, you could, you know, so I'm, my next book, the one I'm working on right now, is really gets into this stuff in a in very deep, you know, a lot of detail and uses a lot of examples and everything. Um, but like, if you go all the way back to the, the dawns of human culture, um, you know, when we lived as foragers and and that sort of a thing, um, there was still a God concept. Uh, the God concept was more in co-ate. Uh, it was, um, you know, diffuse. It was sort of, um, it was animistic in nature. So uh, there was sort of a blurring between the subject, what we would think of as the subjective and the objective. And, um, you know, the anthropological literature uh, gets into this stuff in, in some, you know, clarifies things to some degree on this. And there's talk of mana um, from, from uh, you know, the anthropological studies of these different cultures that have sh shared similar God concepts. Um, and so we can see that that is a pervasive psychological idea um, in these cultures at these complexity levels. Um, and then when you start getting the early state um, and agricultural societies. And, um, you know, you start seeing the rise of, uh, you know, Babylon and Acadia and these sort of like old Mesopotamian empires and things like that, right? Then this new God concept comes online because of the complexification of culture. So the God concept then shifts to something more anthrop uh, anthropomorphic. And then you get deities, you get the gods, you get pantheons, you get the, you know, the, the gods of Homer and, 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 and uh, you know, the, the Indian pantheon and whatnot. And these are beings that are powerful, um, you know, anthropomorphic beings, um, still largely amoral, but that's kind of the God concept. And you can mark that across culture at that particular level of cultural complexity. And then uh, that evolves into this sort of um, universal, uh, you know, being uh, the, the kind of transcendent cosmic judge figure. Um, and that is that sort of is closest to that old man in the sky idea of God, right? It's somewhere between that kind of like, um, you know, g the gods pantheon, you know, Homeric sense of like an anthropomorphic figure, but it also has a sort of moral element of like, you know, the, the heavenly father looking down from above and being up in the clouds and that sort of thing. Thing, right and that comes from a specific stage of cultural complexity um and but that's not the end of it right so god the god concept continues to evolve and then you start getting um the advent of well actually reductionistic science which is where the story kind of links back to, to itself because uh that reductionist that early scientific revolution is really really undoes that whole pre-modern conception of God and really challenges it. And so then you start getting kind of scientific conceptions of the ultimate. Um, and there, you know, the, the God concept shifts again. Uh, you can either have like a personal relationship with God uh, or you can have uh, God is sort of the deist vision of like the, the, the figure who set all the, the laws up and then kind of step back or, um, you know, various forms of kind of rational um, religion, let's say, and that can take different forms. Um, I mentioned at the outset, uh, my interest in apologetics, right? Um, and I think that people who are kind of at that stage individually are, are keen to rationalize religion, but that's sort of a, a late stage of the pre-modern God and hasn't yet kind of fully uh, taken into account the, the insights of, you know, the depths of the insights of kind of, um, you know, the scientific modern worldview. Now, that is sort of where God evolves to up to that point, but the process keeps going, culture keeps evolving and complexifying. You get 
the transition from modern culture then to postmodern culture. And then we start appreciating that uh, a deeper sense of, of the universal aspect of the uh, quality of the deity and the paradox and the mystery and all these sort of ideas start to come online. And then you get the transformation from postmodernism to metamodernism. And that is sort of the paradigm that I'm situating emergentism in. And in that paradigm, that's when you actually get the self-conscious story of complexification and the evolution of consciousness has been unfolding. And in that kind of level of complexity, culturally, uh, that's where you start seeing ideas about the evolution of consciousness and elevation of consciousness and uh, the mysticisms that that's, that start to be grounded in an appreciation that like the self is what is uh, going undergoing this kind of broad evolutionary journey uh, through time and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, my point there is that when we talk about God, we tend to assume that God means the old man in the sky because that's kind of the most popular God concept out there. But that really only represents one form of the God concept that comes from a particular stage of cultural complexity. And so what I'm trying to do with emergentism, for example, and other people are doing in, in different ways as well, is trying to articulate a more up-to-date God concept. Um, and, and that does require sort of reconceiving, reimagining, rearticulating what God is in light of now these narratives of complexity and emergence and that sort of a thing. So that is why I feel justified using a word like God in this book, um, because I think that you can trace the continuity of this idea through time, even as you see that it evolves and complexifies. And so I'm trying to articulate, um, yeah, a, a God concept that is sort of at the cutting edge of this uh, complexification process. Um, and also owning that this is not the final version either. You know, there will be additional changes and evolutions and metamorphoses to the God concept that uh, lie in the future. But, um, you know, those are still hidden from us. But this seemed like uh, important work to be doing at a time when that older God concept just isn't working for people. You know, the old man in the sky uh, yeah, people justly are like, well, that's silly. That's not how this works anymore. But if you think that that's what God means, then you're stuck because you're like, oh, okay, well, if the only way to believe in God is to believe that there's some man in the sky, well, I'm not going to do that. And I guess if I can't do that, then I have to adopt this sort of nihilistic, um, you know, meaningless stance that supposedly modern science is all about. Or I can do, I can just put my head down you know, hold my breath and believe it and become a fundamentalist, right? Because that is sort of the God concept of prevalent among fundamentalist religions right now is some version of the man in the sky. Um, so that's sort of the impasse that we're at in in, in trying to make meaning spirituality uh, in the modern world right now is like, am I a fundamentalist who believes in the God man in the sky? Or am I a nihilist who believes that, no, that's all hogwash and there is no meaning. And what people don't yet realize is that, well, those aren't your only options. There are, there are other things things that have come online over the past, you know, 50 uh, years, let's say, in the evolution of culture, which is ongoing, where more complex notions of meaning and purpose and even God exist. Um, and so my emergentism book is trying to, you know, bring those to people's consciousness and help spread uh, those conceptions, because I think that they're urgently needed. Yeah, I appreciated that part of reconceptualizing God. Um, you also write that m mundane as it may sound, our spiritual lives begin by simply keeping it together to resist the draw of breakdown, randomness, and disorder, to fight the solution and continue the universe's improbable journey of creating more structural integrity, to not only maintain form and complexity, but to add to it, expand it, and deepen it. So, I find that I'm, and my own spiritual journey began with kind of seeing through form and kind of allowing things to fall apart and dissolve and to kind of accept weakness and to let go of order and structure. And I, I certainly think that after that came a rebuilding phase. And, and maybe this is related to the Buddhist teaching of form is emptiness and emptiness is form, um, where we have to start with seeing through appearances of relativity and then learning to function within appearances of relativity. So I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on this, because I was just trying to like map yeah. my own experience with saying that, because it seems like you're leaning more into order and structure and form. 
Yeah. Yeah. This is a very rich topic. Um, I'll uh, I'll give the simple answer up front, and then we could go into some of the the, the deeper elements to this. But the way I tend to look at it is. Um, If you think about complexification um, as development, something is growing and maturing, let's say, um, there comes a point at which um, the ability to understand your own um, process of development uh, has been embedded in particular structures. Um, so for example, right, like you're born, you're taught things, you just you just learn, you grow and, you know, whatever. Um, but then at a certain point, you start to come online, you're like, you're reflective about this whole process. You're like, hey, my teachers taught me certain things. Why did they teach me those things and not others? You start to become aware of like things like systems and power structures and, you know, these sorts of like st structures that exist in the world that, that, that were crucial for the conditioning of your uh, experience of reality. Now, on the one hand, what you're doing is deconstructing something, right? You're, and that's what we call that, like in postmodern deconstruction, this thought, you're, you're, you're taking apart these systems and you're sort of revealing them for what they are. You've become aware of them and you're reflective of them. And so you're, you're able to, to do that. Um, so there's a deconstructive thing that's going on there. But at the same time, you need to have developed to a certain point to be able to do that process. Um, so it takes going through the system to be able to then use what you've learned by that process to sort of gain an understanding of the system and then deconstruct it. Um, and I think something is like that, something like that is going on with, let's say the ego, right? You've got your sense of the ego that starts to come online, um, you know, in the early phases. And at first you're kind of just, you know, well, you're kind of egocentric and you do what you want and you, whatever. And then you start to become aware of other people. And then you have to kind of take that into account. And then you're, then you're getting a more sense of like, well, what do I really like? What do I want? What are the things? And, and then you start to build this sort of persona and all that. Right. And then eventually this doesn't happen for many people, maybe most people, but eventually you can become aware of the ego formation process. And you're like, oh, this is what the ego formation process is about. It's about determining who am I and you know what is and, and then you start to be able to question well what is this I who is this me right but that's a developmental process a, a five-year-old can't do that a 10-year-old can't do that you know a, a teenager is very unlikely to be able to do that so there's something that is growing and developing and complexifying to be, begin to be able to do that and so you can think of complexification itself as leading towards the capacity to um to do what you were just talking about and at a certain point this kind of becomes a semantic metaphorical distinction right because um you know we're using metaphors that then begin to clash with each other because on the one hand it's like you build up until you build down well wait that doesn't really make sense right so it's it's it, it, some of this is just some semantic confusion and the different images that we're using to describe certain uh kind of spiritual processes and things um and you know so like susan cook reuter's model of ego development speaks to this very explicitly that you know this is sort of the arc that you go through and uh you get to the kind of post-conventional stages and then you're able to deconstruct the ego um that sort of a thing um I I find this a really interesting topic and uh, really important too, and um, I I think that there needs to be more time spent clarifying exactly what this process is and, and how we best conceive it. Um, but so that would be the short answer to this idea, right? Is that no, it really still is a complexification developmental process, but it's one in which you are kind of further able to disembed yourself from the assumptions and the you know the conditioning and all that sort of thing. Um, but the other thing I'll say briefly is that there is some legitimate uh, confusion, or let's say at the very least, different takes on this uh, idea. Um, and some spiritual processes or uh, activities or practices really are about regressing. Um, and and it's an open question, the value of that. Um, I And... and <sighs> More than that, some spiritual processes can be conceived of as either regressing or progressing, uh, and and whether or not they are inherently one or the other, and why and what that is really going on there. I think this is a really crucial issue, and I'll frame this 
in this way to explain why I think this is so important. So I talked earlier about uh, nihilism, right, and how both fundamentalism and kind of modernist reductionism and nihilism are forms of nihilism um, because they're all saying no to the world. They want to get you out of the world um, or they want to just give up on the idea of meaning, right? But like there's a sense in which uh, there's a sense in which all this is bad and it's it's all doesn't really matter anyway, let's say. It doesn't matter. So that's nihilism and that's nasty religion and nasty uh, meaninglessness. Now, there is a very compelling case to be made that not just Christian fundamentalism is nihilism, but many other forms of religion as well, uh, including what we tend to think of as some forms of mysticism. Um, you know, when Buddhism was initially introduced to the West, it was understood as Eastern nihilism um, because it was the it was the belief that uh, life is bad. We've got to get out of it. And the way you do that is basically by embracing the void and, and nothingness uh, and emptiness. And um, I think that it's more complicated than that. But I do think that some. There's an element in which that's true for some people and in some traditions, and this becomes very complicated because different traditions can relate to the ideas of the traditions at different levels of understanding and complexity and everything. But um, the degree to which what we really should be trying to do with our existence is basically obliterate consciousness entirely um, does seem to correlate with some forms of spiritual practice, which I would see as being nihilistic. So this is a very interesting question, and it's really, it's an unresolved tension in my own thinking, right? Because it goes to the core of what spirituality is all about. What What is the spiritual life about? Is it about becoming more open-minded and understanding, regressing back to a pre-conscious level and actually obliterating the sense of phenomenal existence entirely and by hurling yourself into the void, as it were, and getting out? Um and, uh, you know, different articulations of this journey exist. And so there are different ways of understanding it and everything. But the, the question of nihilism is really crucial and um, is really what all my work is about. And I want desperately to be able to articulate a spirituality that is not nihilistic. And that's why I find the complexification narrative so attractive, apart from even just the fact that it seems to be just the way things are. But, you know, psychologically, it's fulfilling to me because for so much of my life, the religion and the spirituality that I've been presented with has been nihilistic in nature. It's been, oh, we're, we'll, you know, the apocalypse is going to come and we'll get out of here and then blah, blah, blah. Um, or even, oh, okay, well, what about, what about meditation? What about enlightenment? Oh, no, we're just doing that because consciousness is the experience of suffering and we want to obliterate consciousness. Oh, well, I don't like that either. Uh, and then, you know, then you read Nietzsche and he's like, really critical of all this stuff, but then he wants to like create over men and like, uh, you know, be like a, a Chaser uh, a Borgia. So it's like, well, that's not good either. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm part of what compels me to even think about a project of like trying to articulate a religious framework is I feel like we need to grapple with this problem. Um, so anyway, that, that's, that's a long answer. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, it's a great answer. I guess what's coming up for me is because I, I am thinking about Buddhism and how it's often the teachings are often perceived as nihilism and like emptiness is perceived as nihilism, but em that's not what emptiness really means. Um, and and it, it seems like in, you know, the, the highest states of meditation, which many, many people report as being like cessation, which is like complete, just complete nothingness. Right. Um, but it seems like there's something in that. And even for myself, like having ego dissolute, like ego dissolving experiences, like what five MEO spoke a lot about that. But, um, and you mentioned that in your book also, but like there's something in that, like seeing the ego dissolve completely and then coming back and the ego coming back online. Now your relationship with that is completely, uh, different. So there's something in the void, there's something in the emptiness, there's something in the nothingness that is actually. It's not. It's not the way we understand. It's not the way we conceptualize nothingness and emptiness, because it actually uh, brings awe. And one, like one of the things that one of the there was a quote that it's like uh, true emptiness is wondrous being. Like I was just reading this, so it's like it actually it's like you become completely open and curious. It's not like you re retract and 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 move away from life, which is which is like a 
patholo- it, that is a patho- that could be a pathological way. It's like I'm just all I'm going to do is meditate and sit in cessation somewhere and not engage in life. Yeah, I, I think that's great. And I would agree, like, I would be all on board with an articulation in which, for example, right, I like the way you put that when you experience the void, and then you jump, and you get back into this ego state, then you can compare them, then you can, then you have a better sense of what the ego is, right? Um, that to me is growth, that is development, because, uh, you know, people like Robert Keegan and other developmental thinkers really understand development as being, well, Piaget. I mean, the whole tradition of human development is one in which the subject is continually being disembedded in that which they were blind to before and being able to be to take uh, their their self as the subject or sorry, as the object. And like what more radical way could you do that? But by the total dissolution of the ego and the experience of the non-ego and then being able to come back into the ego and compare those two experiences like then you see that whatever it is that you are has to contain somehow both of those things so you've included both of them you have complexified because now you are formlessness and you are form at the same time so like you know various forms of uh, vajrayana buddhism and these sorts of more uh, esoteric ideas of formlessness and form being one i can that i can grok much more um because i feel like that really does fit in much nicer with a sense of this is the complexification process and that when we do that when we're able to make that separation and then compare we're able to get a much better sense of what the self is and it is this all encompassing total um reality um and and then you have one narrative of of continued growth of continued um yeah complexification and self knowledge and and increasing uh kind of objectification of the ego on a process that ultimately leads to the dissolution of the ego entirely that then is able to recognize that there's something outside of that ego concept and whatever that is needs to then be taken into the sense of what the self is. And anyway, so this is where, this is where it all leads to this sort of mystical Omega thing. Yeah. And I think, I think what you're saying maps well, and even if you look at Buddhism, there's a complexification, like you said, Mariana Tantra, it's like, it's Mm -hmm. coming back and embracing all the form. It's coming back Mm -hmm. and like, actually, you know, embracing everything, embracing sex, embracing alcohol, embracing every, because it's all part of the same thing. It's all part of reality. So I think it maps well with, with that too. Um, So then I guess one more thing that I would like to explore is, uh, this is where really kind of grounding this whole theoretical approach, grounding it in practices. And you talk about having practices on four levels. Maybe you could unpack that a little bit and, and maybe even bring, bring in what are your practices? What are your own practices? How do you embody emergentism in your life? Yeah. So yeah, the four levels are based on these four levels of complexity, matter, life, mind, and culture. Um, because that's what we are. That's what the universe is made out of. Um, but that's what we are certainly made out of. Um, and so we can engage intentionally and, and consciously in sort of trying to maximize the potency of all of those levels. Um, you could think of it that way. So we have a material level, a kind of vital biological level, a neuronal, you know, uh, reflexive, emotional level, and a uh, conceptual, cultural level, uh, all going on simultaneously. And, um, you know, I was very influenced by Lehman Pascal's notion of the integrative surplus model of, of spirituality, as he frames it, right? That we have all these subsystems to our our body and and to our culture as well, and we we have that sense of the spiritual intensity when we are most maximally integrating those various subcomponents of ourselves. And we generate the sort of surplus um, integration, uh, the surplus cohesion. And that is like, that's when when we're, when we're in those flow states, right. Or when we're um, feeling this like intensity or the energy of things, we're really, harmonized um, very much in our, our our different parts. So that's one way of thinking about the emergent uh, ecology of practices is, um, is trying to integrate all of these levels of our being, our material, biological, um, mental, and cultural. So yeah, you, um, you quoted that section where I talk about um, trying to keep it together, um, trying to value uh, the sort of continual um, war against chaos 
right? Um, and uh, I think, you know, this level of spiritual practice was really uh, popularized in a big way with the work of Jordan Peterson not so long ago, you know, clean your room, um, keep, you know, that sort of thing. There's something that um, I think also tends to be the case in nihilistic societies is like, we start to lose touch with these things. We start to give up. We start to like, let it go, but not in a good way, right? Not in that sort of spiritual way of like learning to let go. We let it go because we just become irresponsible because we be, we, yeah, we give up. Um, and that's the nihilism uh, taking hold of things. And so I think it's very spiritually insightful for people to realize, no, like don't give up. Don't let that go. Keep it together. Um, clean your room, you know, uh, maintain order in your existence. Um, because in an emergentist framework, that's the basis of reality is like matter being uh, structurally uh, sound, you know, coming together, forming these holes, right, we need to uh, value order. Um, and the principle of entropy is pervasive, and will always be doing whatever it can to sort of like make things fall apart. So at our foundational level, we should be agents, shepherds of order, trying to uh, maintain things, build things, cohere things, make them sound and structurally stable. And so that's a spiritual practice. Um, and, you know, I li- I give lists of multiple versions of this in, uh, in the book, but I'll just name a few here for time's sake. Um, and then, so that's kind of a matter level practice, but we also have a, a, a life level set of practices and at the life level now you've got this whole aspect to your your the coherency of your living organism um and so i tend to think of this as vitality right like there's that feeling that you get when you're working out let's say or doing something strenuous or you know there's something there and and you're feeling this the flow of energy and blood through your body and you're you're you you feel empowered you know, you feel um, like you can take on the world sort of thing. That's the sort of vitality that I think is at the core of our our, our essences as living beings. And we should um, we should be intentional about trying to cultivate uh, that those kinds of experiences. Um, so anything from yeah, exercise to exertion um, to to you know uh, eating healthy. Um, maintaining the the biological integrity of the organism um, is crucial, um, and so uh, yeah, that's that's a, a core aspect to that level. At the mind level, we're talking about your nervous system, and that's when you start getting things like emotions come online in animals. Um, you know, a, a tree might have a basic sense of what's good and bad for it, but like you kind of need a nervous system before you're going to be like, I am attracted to that. It pulls me forward. It moves me. I am moved towards it versus I am repulsed by that. I want to move away from that. That is ugly. That is nasty, right? So like our valences come online at the mind level. And um, yeah, practices at that level relate to things like emotional regulation, you know, being aware mindful of like our our responses to negative stimuli or stressful stimuli um which is very easy to kind of lose touch with and then you're just sort of owned by your emotions um and you know this is this is where you start to see the emergence of things like wisdom practices you know like plato you know, 25,000, 2,500 years ago was talking about things like the soul having two horses and one is the emotions and one is the reason. And like, you don't want to be governed by your, you know, emotions and everything. Um, But I think that's important. We recognize that there's something spiritual in being able to have a certain kind of uh, control of yourself and being able to attend to situations with your uh, full cognizance and abilities um, and to not snap at people and be mean and reflexive and reactive and that sort of a thing. Um, But also, you know, we get a lot of trauma that winds up being sort of embodied at that level. And so I think there's uh, important therapeutic things that need to happen at this level that are important spiritual practices. And that can be things like therapy or yoga or dance or things that help help uh, process, you know, the various aspects of our of our nervous beings, um, you know, our neuroses and our nervous, uh, our nervousness are all related to our nervous system. And um, so, you know, doing tasks and practices that lead to maximal um uh, opti- you know, optimal conditions at that level is what that's about. And then finally, the culture level is uh, where you start getting symbols and language and the narrative structure. And that really is where you start really experiencing 
the self, the ego, um, really, because we are always narrating our stories about ourselves and who we are and that sort of a thing. And, um, but yeah, I mean, really the essence of human culture is tied up in at this level. Um, so everything that we do that's distinctly human is, is here. Um, so there's a lot that kind of ties into this level, but for me, one of the most important is learning. Um, you know, a big theme of the whole book is that the universe is a learning process underway, uh, that the universe itself is waking up to self-knowledge, and that as time progresses, this complexification story is ultimately one in which the universe is coming to greater knowledge. Um, and because it's the universe, it's greater self-knowledge, um, and that we are a part of that process. We're like at the forefront of that process because no other organ that we know of has conceptual knowledge, right? So like, even just the, the fact of being a human being and being able to learn things conceptual us is like a very meaningful thing. Um, so I see education and, and the development of the mind, the, phil the philosophical uh, life as being a spiritual practice. And again, I mean, I don't think that that uh, should be too surprising. Like that's that used to be very much how philosophy was understood as a spiritual practice before it got kind of institutionalized and made into just sort of something that academics do. Um, but uh, yeah, so learning, uh, reading, that sort of a thing, enhancing your knowledge of the world, because as you enhance your knowledge of the world, the universe grows in self-knowledge. Um so there are other things there using our understanding of complexity to make the world better. You know, now that we know that things are integrative complex systems with emergent properties, applying that knowledge to uh, things like government and education and the various systems that we live in to try to improve uh, the world that we inhabit is, um, is crucial, but also like uh, permaculture and gardening and using our understanding of complexity to facilitate growth and flourishing um, you know, there's a really vital role that human beings have a unique capacity to play as self-conscious, cognitive, conceptual beings to increase the level of vitality in the world in a way that nature couldn't on its own. And I find that a beautiful idea. You know, right now we generally are destroying more than we're producing of this sort of vitality. But like, if we really got collectively the ideas of permaculture and uh, ecological complexity, we could be partners with the with the with the natural forces of the world to increase that. And uh, I find that a, a beautiful idea. And the last thing I guess I'll say at this level is, yeah, meditation is um, is practicing metacognition, being able to uh, sit down, become aware of the self, become cognizant of what's going on in the ego formation process and trying to get behind the scenes of all that. Um, that is, you know, the process of enlightenment and spiritual growth that uh, we are the universe engaging in, you know. Uh, so uh, if the cosmic complexification process is one in which the universe is gaining self-knowledge or a kind of gnosis, um, leading towards awakening. Well, like that's what we're doing. That's what we have the capacity to do. And so I think that uh, we should kind of embrace that responsibility. Um, so those are some practices I name in the book uh, along with others. Um, and honestly, you asked about myself. I mean, I, I don't, I didn't want to be someone who was sort of telling people to do things that I thought might sound good on paper, but I didn't actually like, they didn't really mean anything to me. So most of what I'm speaking about are come from my own experience. You know, I, I, I tried to be honest about that. I don't always live up to all of them. Um, I've been eating more meat lately, for example, than I should. And my meditation practice over the past couple months has fallen off. Um, but, uh, but in terms of like some of these ideals, I feel like, okay, these are, these are all things that, um, are, are really important. And I would say that, uh, for me, yeah, I, I was basically trying to articulate my own set of ecology or my own ecology of practices uh, in this book. Um, I think we tend to think about spiritual practices as being, you know, oh, oh, the, 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 the spiritual path is one of, I don't know, that we, 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 we sort of make it this uh, kind of exotic thing that's all, you know, but like, if you really appreciate like sitting down and reading a book about the world, you know, reading about history or physics or biology or whatever, like, 
that is deeply meaningful and important. And, and, and so learning to sacralize the aspects of our own existence that I think come maybe more organically or naturally to us as spiritual practices is important. And we don't need to, um, yeah, make spiritual, the spiritual life, some strange exotic thing that means you have to be removed from reality or go to a hermitage or something like we should be ingrained, um, uh, in in existence and uh and we should come to be able to see some of these things some of which might seem rather mundane as crucial to the complexif- complexifying organizing self-organizing process of the universe uh yeah yeah i i really appreciate the work that you're doing brendan i'm tuned into your podcast i've been watching different episodes and I've read some of your books especially this this latest latest one i've really dived deep into it uh, for our conversation. And I, I think there's a lot of overlapping interests between us. Like you're very into developmental theory. And, and I see that a lot of your work is, is unpacking that and, in, and using that for spirituality and for understanding metamodernism. And yeah, I just, I appreciate the work you're doing. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to ask if, is there anything else that you wish that I would have asked you that I didn't, or is there anything else you would like to share before we wrap up? I really appreciate uh, having the opportunity. I, it's been really, I mean, as a podcaster myself, it's been really uh, fun for me to be on the other end of the conversations over the past couple of months since the book came out and be able to talk about things. And, um, you know, uh, so I've, I've enjoyed that and I've really enjoyed, yeah, uh, the questions you've asked and the opportunity to talk about them. The only thing I guess I would ask would be, um, you know, I have done a lot of talking. Is there anything I'd love to get your thoughts or a thought about the book any critique or feedback that, you know, you're like, well, what about this? Or this didn't land or so. Uh, yeah. I welcome anything. Uh, any of your thoughts on that? It's funny. Cause I had a, I had a question, like the one thing that kind of stood out for me was like the V the vegetarian thing. Mm. And it's funny. Cause you actually right before said that you've been eating more meat, I guess the way I was understanding, it was like, it seemed like you were prescribing that people should follow a vegetarian diet. Mm. Uh, in an effort to optimize their own health, well-being, and complexity. And for me, it was like I was just wondering, well, can all humans actually optimize mm. their health, well-being, and complexity? Can they all can we all thrive off of vegetables? Or is it that we actually do need mm. some meat sources? Um, does eating eggs cause suffering? Because that's not vegetarian. That's also like something that could be debated. It was yeah. like a very little thing. And I guess for me, because I'm not vegetarian uh-huh. and, you know, I understand the the ethical standpoint of why we shouldn't eat meat. It's I'm just not convinced. I'm not fully convinced that everybody can thrive off of a vegetarian diet. And sure. I see that often a lot of people that do eat vegan or vegetarian eventually seem to come back and eat a little bit of fish at least, or, or they stay on this diet and then they see health problems. And then the question is, yeah, you're not, you're not contributing to the suffering of animals, but you yourself are suffering and Mm -hmm. you're unable to complexify and and to actually resolve problems on a deeper level. So there's these, these kind of, it's a very little thing that I, no, it's, it's, just, a, it's yeah. a great point. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, yeah, I mean, I've had conversations with people about this. And and uh, I think that there's a lot of nuance on this topic. And uh, yeah, I, I, the last thing I end with on that section is around discernment, right? Because what we shouldn't be doing is prescribing like this is the dogmatic way to do it. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, what I think about is that this emergentist complexification narrative, at least allows us to gain some greater clarity about how to think about this sort of thing, right? Because there's such extremes, right? And we either are doing factory feedlots or we're, you know, like certain kinds of spiritual practices actually say we should just not eat anything and kill ourselves. So like those are kind of extremes. And by using complexity, we can understand that if complexity is related to the depth of consciousness, we can try to, you know, be the most ethical possible. So like personally, um, I, I would, so like, I, I'm very comfortable being a pescatarian or even eating chicken, let's say, because like, that's r- relatively low down, but these things do become complex, right? Cause like chickens are raised in these hellish conditions. So then it's like, well, even if the consciousness level is rather minimal, the conditions and the whole kind of, uh, industrial scale aspects of the, the you know, the system are very problematic and, and unethical. And so how do you weigh that out? Um, but, uh, but then like something like a pig, for example, or like a squid, you know, starts to become a lot more, oh, I don't know, like those are more, you know, and so, 
you know, when I eat meat, I tend to eat a lot of chicken or fish. Um, and I, there's a way that I can kind of justify that to myself. If I have like a burger, I'm like, eh, I don't know, this is, uh, you know, that, that cow is a bit higher up that uh, level of mind than the fish or the chicken were. So anyway, but the point is, um, yeah, I think it's important for people to come to those kinds of conclusions on their own and, and, and in a way that's right. But by using this framework for this way of thinking about things, it helps to clarify why rather than just like, well, some guru said I should do this or some, you know, whatever. So, you know, or because it's like either fundamentalists or nihilists will say you should do this one thing or it doesn't matter at all. Nothing matters. Go be a cannibal and eat other human beings as long as you don't ca get caught or, you know, whatever. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a it, that's how I think about those sorts of discussions. But that's a really good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I brought up some of the other things with like, like, how does it how is it is it is the emergentism view antithetical to idealism and we kind of spoke about that and uh i think overall the 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 framework is great i think it's it leads to a kind of embodied sense and a com coming back to really uh grounding our spirituality in our day-to-day -day lives and i really appreciate that because my own trajectory has been you know kind of blowing things apart and <laughs> everything coming apart and then bringing things back together and um, I feel like I'm much better where I'm at now. And that took a lot of rebuilding. So I feel like that's, um, that's that. And, and, you know, it's interesting, like you have the eye, <laughs> you have the eye on the book and the elevating consciousness logo is actually, it's, it's a mindfulness symbol with, um, with the drops coming up, but that's also an eye. And it was like, it's like the universe yeah, yeah. is elevating, becoming more conscious of itself. So there's that kind of overlap there. Yeah, I've been really struck by um, actually the I think for me even goes back to an earlier part of my own spiritual journey where I had this sort of uh, uh, an experience that was really meaningful with this sort of kaleidoscopic eye, which I worked into my original epic poem. That that's sort of the image that I came up with for the emerging God and that sort of a thing. And um, then as I was sort of tuned into that idea, I started seeing it in all these places. Like I'd, I'd read Plato and he would talk about it and, and uh, you know, pseudo Dionysia. It, it would sort of, it started to show up. Um, and I thought that was really intriguing. So there are, there's a, a sort of archetypal quality to it. Um, but the, the idea of the eye ascending kind of you know, emerging from the water is a really kind of interesting image, especially. Um, but yeah, once you're sort of tuned into these sorts of things, you're like, hey, wait, it's the it's the kaleidoscopic eye or what have you. Or Greg Enriquez's model actually himself, he has a little kaleidoscopic eye and he was showing me something. I was like, hey, look, it's the kaleidoscopic eye. So anyway, yeah, it's, uh, it's good stuff. But yeah, this is a great podcast. I really, uh, I've enjoyed the conversations you've had uh, with, with a number of people on here and I'm tuned into your stuff too. So we should... Uh, I don't know. Maybe you can come on the Metamodern Spirituality Podcast sometime and we can talk about your spiritual journey because I'm intrigued. Yeah, for sure. I would love to. I'd love to stay in contact. Uh, appreciate you coming on, Brendan. Appreciate what Thank you, you do. Thank you very much. All the best.